Thank you, Noreen, for having me. This is terrific. The first few slides, I'm so sorry, it's so hard to talk loud with this. Uh, the first few th slides, I'm going to be standing here, but I'm just going to move there because most of my talk is with tons of videos to get you excited about uh, laryngology. So just a bit about myself. My name is Sarah Abuganem. Uh, I'm assistant professor at SUNY Downstate and Maimonides. This is my journey with laryngology. I did my residency in Tel Aviv uh, Sarovsky Medical Center, affiliated with Tel Aviv University. Then I continued for my first laryngology fellowship. Um, I'm doing like this at, at SF, uh, in SF, because it's 30 minutes from SF. Um, that was at Stanford. And then I continued for another year um, in NYU Voice Center. And now here I am. Uh, um, my new home is Brooklyn. I see patients mainly at the UPB ENT site. Uh, that's in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, and the rest of my week I spend in Maimonides. I also see patients every other week in Kings County uh, and uh, SUNY Downstate. So basically um, today, the next 30 minutes, I hope I'm gonna get you all excited about what laryngology is and what, what do I offer in my laryngology service. Um, I would say probably 60% of the patients that I see are patients with voice and uh, malignant and premalignant lesions of the vocal folds and larynx. Uh, the rest, 40% will be patients with airway and swallowing problems. And I think from now on, I'm just, I'm just gonna move over there and continue with the rest. Okay, so as I said, uh, the first part is really, uh, or the main patients that I see are patients with voice issues. So just a um, brief definition of what is the hoarseness or dysphonia. This is based on our um, guidelines, um, the Academy, Academy of Otolaryngology. We always say hoarseness, but hoarseness is really just a change in voice quality. Um, I would rather use the term uh, dysphonia. Dysphonia is basically change in either voice quality, pitch, loudness, or vocal effort. Hoarseness is just aspect of voice change. Of course, uh, there is tons of questions that you need to ask every patient that comes to clinic. I just like to, in my mind, to say that every voice patient is a throat patient. So I usually ask all the following, the swallowing, voice, and airway. Of course, we start with, uh, like every other patient, with past medical history, surgical history, medications, allergies, occupation, what are the vocal demands, etc. And then in terms of the voice, what I normally do is I, I start with an open question. How would you describe your voice? And you'll be amazed how, how nice and how easy for patients we just ask them, not just tell them, oh, do you feel like you're hoarse? No, because it's just more than this. They will describe that their voice is breathy, that they cannot get loud, that their voice will get weaker towards the end of the day, that it's high pitch, low pitch than usual, et cetera. Uh, there are different ways to assess uh, the quality of life of these patients. Uh, VHI questionnaire is probably the most used, uh, and I definitely use that for every new patient and also during follow-ups. Physical exam, like any other physical exam, obviously an ENT clinic is gonna be dedicated to the ENT parts. But the most important thing is basically is the indirect laryngoscopy. Uh, I put here uh, this X mark. I, I know that there are some ENTs out there that are still using mirrors, not so much in advanced clinics, uh, right now, what we normally use is a flexible scope. The indication to use flexible scope based on our guidelines is anytime you feel like uh, there is an indication, but otherwise it's if someone has hoarseness or change in voice, that is more than four weeks. So if you know anyone with hoarseness over four weeks or change in voice, this is a time to refer them to ENT to see what's going on there. What do we do with the flexible indirect laryngoscopy? Is basically we place the scope through the nose down the throat. We position the patient in a sniff position. This is basically the classical position. We use a decongestion and local anesthetic sprays. This is just to make them feel more comfortable. Of course, we need to report different things. Uh, it's not just the larynx that we always jump and want to see. There are, we need to document what do we see in the nose, uh, different parts of the pharynx, and of course, as I said, the larynx. When we document the larynx, uh, it's mostly the vocal folds that we're interested in patients with dysphonia. We look at the mobility. Uh, is the mobility symmetric or not? The, meaning the right and uh, left vocal folds are opening uh, together and the same. We look at the abduction, opening, adduction, uh, closing, 
we look at the edges of the vocal fold, do we see masses? Do we see any irregularity along the mucosal surface? How is the closure? Is it complete closure or is it incomplete like we see here? And how is the vibration? Uh, this is a really brief example. If we're using a regular flexible scope, how does it look when we scope a patient? This is us just pushing the scope through the nose. Now getting to the larynx. And these are the vocal folds we're looking right now. I just want you to, this is the left side and this is the right side. The left side is now moving. It's a bit twisted. I, the only purpose I want you to see this video is to see this regular flexible scope and how nice my scope is, the distal chip scope that I'm using in my ENT clinic. See how the difference of, in terms of how sharper and brighter the distal chip scope. So the regular scopes are what we normally use in every ENT clinic. Distal chip scopes are twice as much in, in terms of the price and you only find them in laryngology clinics. And they really allow you so much better view in terms of, of the larynx. This is a patient, this is the anterior part, posterior part, this is the right side and this is the left. And what we're looking right now is there is vocal folds. Every time he takes a nice, or she takes a nice deep breath, the vocal folds will open. Every time they say E or sustained phonation, the vocal folds will close. So this is basically what we do in clinic. Another tool that we have is stroboscopy. I like to think about it that the vocal folds don't just open and close, they also vibrate. Uh, so part of our exam is not just to assess the mobility, but also the vibration. How does it look uh, during the exam? Is, is basically using a flashing light. That basically the, the flashing light flashes this light um, in accordance to the frequency of the vibration. And how it looks is like this. It gives you basically a slow motion of the vibration. This is the vibration that I'm looking at. This is the vocal folds closed right now. But it looks like they're opening, it's not. It's just a vibration. So that's for me helpful in terms of diagnosing different uh, pathologies. The stroboscopy has been shown to change diagnosis in up to 50% of the patient. It definitely helps me uh, more than just uh, uh, regular light. Um, there are new techniques out there. This is an example of high-speed laryngeal imaging. Um, unlike the strobe that shows us uh, a slow motion and just uh, different frames of the, of the, of the cycle, the, of the vibration cycle, the high-speed laryngeal imaging show us all the vibration and basically it's all the movement of the vocal folds. We're not seeing slow motion, we're seeing the whole thing. No one is really using this, let's just face it. It's more for nice presentations, uh, but it's out there. I know that like maybe there is one place that is using it, but it's probably mostly for research. Um, in terms of differential diagnosis, there are so many different things that can cause hoarseness or dysphonia. We usually like to uh, divide them to inflammatory, neoplasia, um, neuromuscular, um, and others. Uh, I'm going to dive in in a second about all the options. Whatever the cause for the dysphonia, um, the treatment are pretty much the same for everyone. Um, I would usually would start with voice therapy. We work as a laryngologist, we work very closely with speech language pathologists in terms of conservative treatment. Some, some patients will get better just by medical treatment like PPIs, antifungal, antibiotics, or steroids. Um, in office procedure, I would say this is probably uh, just getting most, like the popularity is just increasing and increasing. We do less and less uh, in the operating room and more and more in clinic. We can do from injections of material to augment the vocal folds, steroid injection, Botox injections, even a KTP laser in office. And surgery, you all guys um, know the dark laryngoscopy but the, that we can offer here. Uh, and last is open surgery. Most of that will be thyroplasty. So let's dive in just a bit to just show you some uh, different or classification of voice disorders. I will start with the most important one, right? Uh, this is uh, every patient, as we said, more than four weeks needs to be referred to ENT to look at the, their vocal folds. What, is, what are we mostly concerned about is obviously malignant uh, lesions. This is an example of a 50, 59, I'm sorry, year old female, non-smoker, five months of dysphonia. This is uh, the OR imaging, uh, OR pictures. And this is me scoping her just before intubation. I hope you can appreciate here the mass that is just blocking her airway. 
uh, we ended up uh, just uh, intubating her with um, flexible bronchoscope. Okay, so this is one example. Uh, this is her taking her to the operating room after first, the first direct longoscopy was basically just to make her breathe and take this big mass. Uh, once that was confirmed as squamous cell carcinoma, she was offered the treatment options for early stage squamous cell carcinoma, either um, transoral resection or radiation, and she chose to continue with transoral uh, treatment. And this is me, uh, basically during the case, was, uh, what I did is ended up uh, ablating her tumor using KTP laser. This is another example of a 61-year-old male, former smoker this time, uh, that presented to my clinic, I think that was in MIMO, uh, with one year of dysphonia. So you can appreciate, you saw how normal vocal fold look like. Um, definitely not what we see right here. And you can see this in a second. You can see how difficult it can be sometimes to get a nice picture. Okay, you got the picture, right? Very edematous, irregular, leukoplakia. So that, that, I'm sorry, unfortunately this patient, we continue on, we did the biopsy, uh, but his uh, uh, staging, at, at his staging after a CAT scan, he was a candidate for radiation therapy that was no longer, um, can be resected via uh, transoral resection. So that's sad when it's um, more advanced. Other, um, other lesions uh, that we see very, very common are just benign stuff. So let's talk about some basic things that we see quite often. Vocal fold nodules. Vocal fold nodules is probably, probably one of the com most common thing. What we normally see is bilateral mid vocal fold lesions. I want to show you when, once I'm going to hold it. Unfortunately, the other, okay, go ahead. So we see here just mid bilateral vocal fold lesions, what they do is it's just area of fibrotic tissue that just prevents from the vocal fold of closing. That will also gonna affect the vibration. So obviously the patient is gonna be hoarse or dysphonic. The treatment for that of vocal fold nodules as well as vocal fold polyp usually would start with voice therapy. So we'll send this patient to voice therapy. If they do not respond, um, we will think or consider to do surgery. So that's the, the, the first treatment option. The other very common thing that we see is vocal fold cyst. Uh, this lesion is usually, you would see it just under the mucosa. Uh, this, treat, this kind of lesion usually do not respond, doesn't respond to uh, voice therapy, and those patients will end up uh, mostly doing uh, dark laryngoscopy and resecting. This is actually a case here from Bay Ridge. So you can see here, we created the micro flap in the vocal fold and gently uh, managed to, uh, to take this cyst out. You don't want to puncture that cyst. Another very common entity that we see, this is in your head as you think about this old lady with a very low voice and she's been smoking like forever. Um, this is the rinky's edema and polypoid corditis. This is how it looks. Uh, most of the time the treatment will start by, please ma'am, stop smoking. Uh, but usually some, if the voice is really bad or it's so enlarged that it's starting to block the airway, uh, then we will need to reject that or ablated with laser. This is a case that we did here actually also in King, uh, it, uh, at Bay Ridge uh, that we laser it with a CO2 laser this time. Another very common, less, you won't see this with us in the operating room is vocal fold, uh, process granuloma. What this is, is mainly related, these are the patients that come to, your, to my clinic or you see them in the elevator and they're uh, um, doing the clear, uh, clearing their throat excessively all the time. <coughs> Uh, that can be related either to post-intubation uh, uh, or to reflux. We think about that as a cause. And this is indeed uh, what I did with this kind of patient, this specific patient that I was convinced it's more of a, uh, a reflux related. So we just treated it uh, with PPI, with omeprazole, um, and it just uh, got better. I can show you how it looked before. That would be more interesting. Sorry that I didn't get to edit everything. You see on the right side is, uh, le is after, but I want you to see before. And this is the before, you can see here the vocal fold process, granduloma. Okay, let's continue. Can I ask a question? Sure. Besides PPI, 
What the granuloma goes away. It just goes by itself. So the question was, uh, if I do anything else besides giving the medication, usually, no, I just follow it. So I usually give the PPI and then uh, more education in terms of how to stop the throat clearing. It's, it's uh, eventually, at the end of the day, throat clearing is just a habitual thing. So it would, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. it would just go, go away. Surgery, we usually don't do, only because the uh, chance of recurrence is so high. It's just better to just educate the patient. It will just go by itself, usually by a few months sometimes. Uh, this patient took him around like eight or two and a half months, uh, eight weeks to two and a half months to, for it completely to be resolved. Um, Vocophil leukoplakia is not really a disease, it's not a pathological disease, more of a white patch, right? Uh, just like any other thing that we see in the vocophils, we need first uh, is to rule out that it's not cancer. This is an example of a patient that came with dysphonia and we saw this uh, white patch on their vocophils. Uh, th this case is actually, I think, for my fellowship. And what we did is eventually we took, in, we took the patient to the operating room um, we confirmed it's not cancer, and the next, the next stage after he came back and again with, uh, um, with the leukoplakia yes, is just treating it with KTP laser in office. So this is how we can do it. Recurrent uh, respiratory papillomatosis, fairly, very, very, very common. Uh, we see this more in kids, but also in adults, and I, I'm starting to see, uh, I had some interesting cases lately with Patients, six-year-old, first presentation, very not typical. Of course, we, like every other, in my head, everything is cancer until proven otherwise. Even those HPV, respiratory papillomatosis, um, it's very important to rule out it's not cancer and also to do typing of what HPV is involved. As we know, HPV virus, uh, there are different subtypes uh, and there are types that are considered to be associated with malignancy. See how bad the voice sounds. What we do usually for uh, these kind of uh, uh, um, lesions, we can resect them with micro debrider, less skimmer and stuff like that. Another option is the KTP laser. As you can see, it's like, I feel like I'm doing a presentation about KTP laser. It's probably one of my favorites. This is an example of a patient. This is the irregularity of the pemidomatosis. I know it looks like uh, a bomb just exploded in his airway. It's just the uh, the first uh, during the surgery, and it will heal much better after. This is us uh, treating him. Uh, and what we did is, again, biopsy typing of the lesions and ablation of the RRP using KTP laser. Another very common example that we see is uh, vocophil paralysis. Vocophil paralysis can be associated with two things. It can either cause glottic insufficiency, meaning um, it can cause the patient not to be able to close the vocophil. Let me show you how it looks. Uh, so see how it happens? He's, he's trying to close his vocal fold, but the left one is paralyzed, and just right now, it's power median position. This patient, his voice is going to be very breathy. So you need to help him, right? Unlike this patient, that see how they look without glottic insufficient. This is a patient that we injected, so obviously he looks much better than this other guy on the right side. What does it mean when we say injection? Uh, the injection, what we do is basic, basically we do injection laryngoplasty or augmenting. I always say to the patient, just like we can augment breasts, we can augment vocal folds. What's, what's the logic behind it? If the vocal fold is paralyzed, it cannot get to the midline. Okay? It gets atrophy and cannot close with the other side. And then there is a gap between them. There is glottic insufficiency. What we do during injection, we take the uh, paralyzed one and inject material and just augment it. There are different materials that we can use. Uh, most of the time in office, we can only offer short-term materials, either um, based on cellulose, that will be around three to six months, um, and the carboxy um, and the Kaha ones are the longer ones, um, that will be around 12 to 18 months. Again, short-term. Most of the time, uh, what we do, is the injection is done through the neck. Um, I do it through the neck. Some people, like here in this in this thing, they do it. Uh, uh, they do it through the through the mouth. And what you do is basically inject and and augment the vocal fold. This is how it looks like. One person holds the scope, and while well, I will be uh, performing the injection through the skin. 
Some patients cannot tolerate injection in office. Just the thought of having needle through their skin while they're awake um, freaks them up. Uh, and I can agree that that can be sometimes stressful. Uh, so of course we can do that in the operating room. More, more long-term uh, solution that we can do is thyroplasty. This requires open surgery. I'm sorry how she looks. This is like literally six days post-op. Um, in this case, that was her vocal folds before surgery, and that's uh, right after surgery, and later on, it just got more straighter. So this is what we do. We just push an implant from the outside. This is considered to be the gold standard of paralysis and glottic insufficiency. The last few minutes uh, that I have, I'm just going to review with you some um, other things that are related to my clinic. As I said, I also do swallowing and airway. I, came up, I saw this uh, tweet during... It was probably around March uh, when COVID all started, and this all pictures are from my uh, my own cell phone and the foodie that I am. So in retrospect, I should have developed more hobbies beyond going out to eat, and this is what I do all day long. Uh, but this is also my passion for swallowing. Um, I have a great passion for patients eating, uh, avoiding G-tubes, and getting them uh, just to eat by mouth as early as we can. I feel like that's one of the things that can definitely affect quality of life, and I'm, I'm very passionate about it. I see mainly patients, uh, as I said, with dysphagia, globus, uh, aspiration. I see like Parkinson patients, a lot of them, or neurological patients, post-CVA patients, odinophagia from different reasons. Uh, right now, I'm working very closely with the Maimonides Cancer Center, and I'm starting to see more and more and more uh, patients with post-radiation dysphagia, and this is probably the hardest part um, with, with the job is seeing patients that were not able to eat for two or three or even four years to be completely G-tube uh, dependent, some of them my age. So this is a heartbreaking one. Uh, dysphagia is definitely, is this, the, the proper definition of dysphagia is subjective sensation of difficulty swallowing liquid, solids, or both. Um, and I always say this, dysphagia is a symptom. It's not a sign. So if a patient comes with dysphagia symptom, we need to figure out what's, what's going on and what seems to be the swallowing dysfunction and what level is it. Is it the oral phase? Is it the pharyngeal phase? Is it the esophageal phase? You know, a lot of people can be surprised. Why, how is that related to ENT? We definitely work very closely with the GI and sometimes with the cardiothoracic. But I feel like these patients, we need to see them more and more. Uh, again, in terms of the history, I'm not going to get all the details of all the stuff that we need to ask. So we'll ask about dysphagia, about pain with swallowing, if they feel regurgitation, stuff coming up when they eat, if they cough, choking, history of aspiration, pneumonia, etc. All this is going to help us with figure out the cause of the dysphagia. The symptom, again, I like, I, um, I'm very much interested in quality of life and how much every complaint that patient comes to the office, we want to know how much does it affect their quality of life. And I usually use different questionnaires. This is the E10, probably the most common one. Um, I got to translate this one to Hebrew when I was still a resident in Israel. And we have the PIL-5 questionnaire. Uh, part of the assessment is also to assess the complication of swallowing dysfunction in this patient and, again, to ask about poor nutrition, dehydration, aspiration, uh, aspiration pneumonia, and, of course, uh, the most dreadful uh, complication is death. Uh, there are different signs, as I call it, is basically uh, the objective measures that we need to look at. We have different studies that I can use. Laryngoscopy is definitely part of my exam for, to assess dysphagia. Um, you would amaze how many things and clues for, to understand the dysphagia we can find with the laryngoscopy from cancer and tumors in, in the larynx or pharynx that can cause dysphagia, uh, pulling of saliva, uh, paralysis, so many different things that can contribute to the dysphagia. The two main things that I normally uh, would work with, um, or again, is with the speech language pathologies. I would normally send most of my patients to do either modified barium swallow uh, or fees. This is the fiber optic evaluation of swallow. I can do that in clinic too, and I do this sometimes myself. What you do is basically give the patient different textures of food and see how he, how the patient, um, how the patient swallow. You assess the residue, how much left uh, in the pharynx, um, and you also assess aspiration. You literally have the airway in front of you. If the patient aspirates, you see it in front of you. 
Uh, the main their friendship, th this is a really long list of the stuff. Uh, I marked this in blue, the oropharyngeal, because um, most of the things that I would be do dealing in clinic is the oropharyngeal part. Although I also operate um, in on esophageal pathology, it's mostly related to the upper esophageal area or the es cervical esophagus. The treatment options, I feel like most, like every other, uh, like, just like we saw in dysphonia and voice, we always start with conservative, if we can. Um, I, here, again, I work very closely with different speech language pathologists here in Brooklyn. Uh, we start with dysphagia therapy, uh, diet modification sometimes. Sometimes you just want to give them something by mouth. It doesn't have to have full diet. Even if it will be nectar and soft food, they will be very pleased. Um, medical management, botox injection in pretty rare cases uh, to the CP muscle, esophageal dilation, and open surgery sometimes. This is an example, actually, a recent one that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is a 46-year-old patient, two years after completion of chemo radiation for upper esophageal cancer that came to my clinic with complete esophageal stricture. Uh, what we ended up doing is rendezvous procedure. What it means is opening a complete stricture uh, from both ways. Um, I was operating from above, and GI was operating from below through the G-tube. And then we just, together, just created new tract. Uh, it was a very challenging one. Um, it's hard, it, since you don't know how to read MBS, I can tell you right now, this is a very small quantity passing. Uh, so what we managed to create is now, her esophagus is now open, but this requires uh, multiple dilations to keep that thing open. She now underwent her fourth dilation uh, in two and a half months. Uh, but, luckily, so, but, but now she's eating puree. It's not the best, um, uh, the best uh, quality of life, but it's something. She was NPO for two years. But I think we're going to, I hope in a, uh, that with some, um, some aggressive uh, therapy, she, we will get there. Last, I want to end uh, with last four slides at Airway. This is a patient actually for, and for my fellowship. Uh, this, is, this cannula is 18. Uh, uh, carrot, gold, uh, yes, uh, and it's, of course, customized to her. Uh, this is just to show us how cannulas are, are really part of patients. We need to really, if patients end up with cannula or trach, and that's going to be for a long time, this is part of them. Um, so uh, to me, it was really life-changing moment, I kid you not, just to see that, because for her, it's part, part of her. It's just another accessory. So I appreciate that. Um, the things that I see in clinic is chronic cough, vocal fold dysfunction. That means when people close their vocal folds instead of open them, opening them when they breathe. Subglottic and glottic stenosis, but a lot of vocal fold paralysis and papillomatosis or lesions. Uh, stuff that I can do in clinic, I do, again, is flexible laryngoscopy. Uh, I do flexible tracheoscopy in office as well. This is an example of how we can just, I, the blood that you see here is we injected some steroids. And what I do, do right now is someone else is taking the, the cannula. And then I can continue down to the trachea and look up to the carina. Obviously, I can only do that if I, if I use a, a lidocaine and for the patient not to cough. This is a very, um, a comp a very uh, challenging case of a 50-year-old. Uh, actually, she, uh, um, she's a hospital worker with bilateral vocal fold paralysis. As you can see here, there's no really opening of the vocal fold. She was intubated uh, for four weeks during COVID. Uh, cannulated, decannulated, uh, and now she cannot open her vocal folds. Uh, she was told she has asthma, uh, and obviously the inhalers didn't help. Uh, so what we ended up doing for her um, is uh, we did laser, um, laser surgery in her, did medial or basically what you do is you take chunk of her airway and, and take piece of her, her vocal fold just to open her airway for her to be able to breathe with no, with no cannula. This is an example of post-intubation, uh, sub subglottic and tracheal stenosis that we operate in, uh, operate in the operating room. I don't remember where it was, I think in Maimonides. And what we ended up doing here is just releasing all the scar tissue and doing balloon dilation. Um, I, think, I think I will end it here. Okay, so I think 
This is basically it. Um, just 30 minutes of all the stuff that I do in clinic. And yeah, do you have any questions? Okay. So thank you so, so much for your time and hope to see you again here in Berry Ridge. Thank you guys. Yeah, of course.